Our topic today is Russia's strategy for escalation management. Um, before introducing the speakers and reviewing our protocol for the session, let me just briefly set a little context. Uh, as you know, in 2015, Secretary of Defense Carter, um, following uh, major changes in uh, the relationship with Russia, called for a, a new playbook on Russia. Uh, and as uh, people have gone to work to uh, lay the conceptual foundations for a, a, a new a new playbook. Uh, it's become clear that, uh, in the words of then Deputy Secretary Bob Work, Russia had gone to school on the modern way of American war, uh, the way of war of the United States and its allies, and had developed an approach to regional war heavily dependent on threats of escalation to, to try to keep its adversary from using all, all of the means available to them in such a war. Uh, and uh, thus, to rewrite our playbook on Russia requires that we go to school on the modern Russian way of war, in, including its escalatory aspects. Uh, here at the Center for Global Security Research, we've made a close study of these matters since 2015. Uh, we've followed closely the work of other institutions and tried to bring the, the best of their work to the laboratory community. Uh, in recent years, the Center for Naval Analyses has, has carved out a leading role on this topic. Uh, it has resurrected a Russian studies program uh, that had shuttered in the 1990s. Uh, and we're fortunate today to have two of the leading members of the Center for Naval Analyses team to discuss their newest work on this topic. Um, Michael Kaufman is director of the CNA Russia Studies Program. He also serves as a fellow at the Kennan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center and as a senior editor at War on the Rocks. He holds a master's degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Uh, Dr. Anya Fink is a research analyst with CNA's adversary analytics team. Uh, she's also a member of the Russia Studies Program at CNA. Uh, she completed her doctorate in the School of Public Policy at the University of, of, of Maryland. Uh, before turning to them for their opening remarks, uh, a few rules of the road. Uh, as you all know, we're using the WebEx conference format. That means that the audience has come in muted and not projecting video. Uh, this helps us, of course, to preserve bandwidth for the, for the, the main attraction. Uh, some, perhaps many of you, will want to put questions to the speakers upon conclusion of their remarks. Uh, as you probably know from WebEx, there are three different ways to do this, but we're only using one today. Uh, and that's the chat function. So if you'd like to join the conversation, uh, please send uh, a note with, with your question. Uh, don't raise your electronic hand. Uh, don't submit to the Q&A function. Uh, just uh, send a, a chat note uh, and be sure to select uh, that you're sending the note to all the panelists. Uh, the host is the technical host. I'm not the host, I'm just the, the chair. Uh, when our speakers have finished, I will put the questions to them on your behalf. Uh, so that you're all aware, the speaker's remarks are being recorded today, uh, not, not to follow on Q&A, uh, but the, the presentation itself will be. Uh, posted at the CGR website for broader viewing uh, upon conclusion of the vetting process. So without further ado, uh, Michael, Anya, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for making the time to do this. This, this is really interesting and well done work and we're grateful for the opportunity to learn about it. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that uh, kind introduction, Brad, and thanks for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, let's see, I'm going to share uh, our PowerPoint presentation, which hopefully will work alongside with what we have to say here. Let's see if that, that comes together. Is that working? Yes. It is, yes. That's great. And I can scroll both the notes and it looks like I can scroll for the PowerPoint presentation. Excellent. Okay, great. Okay, um, so let me first kind of open up. I, I think our goal will be to kind of walk you through what are essentially components of the Russian strategy for escalation management, and then show you the whole thing. And then hopefully when you kind of see it the way we do, uh, you'll agree and, and, and it'll make sense. But it, it does involve a number of concepts that come together, 
And as Anya and I will discuss, these concepts have been talked about and debated over several decades as to how the Russian military and Russian thinkers have gotten um, to this place. And, and just to be clear, uh, this project was uh, originally sponsored and funded by UCOM RSI and sort of the result of about a year's worth of work. Let me uh, first begin to kind of explain the Russian problem statement. Why does Russia need a, a theory of escalation management or limited nuclear war? In fact, why do they have some of these concepts? And I've thought about it, and we maybe have not. Uh, Brad, I think, had a great opening on that and has great writing on that subject. But let me make a couple of brief points here first. So the Russian thinking started out with the, uh, the promise of how you deter a conflict during a threatened period of war and to prevent the conflict that starts from escalating across several war archetypes. And the war archetypes we're going to use repeatedly in our conversation from the Russian perspective are local war, which is a single war with a bordering country like Ukraine, Georgia, a regional war against a coalition of states, which is the minimum sized war that Russia envisions with NATO, that is any coalition of states perhaps backed by another great power like the United States, and a large-scale war, which is a multi-theater war against a global force like the United States, essentially a larger conflagration um, from which uh, the regional war escalates into. Okay? Second, address the challenge posed by the precision revolution, right? which essentially from Russian perspective made conventional weapons strategic, and the Russian military has been grappling for decades now with the threat of mass airspace attack by a technologically superior power like the United States, which is principally an expeditionary airspace and maritime power, and understanding that this attack could be conducted directly from the U.S. homeland without even need for European basing. Third, the conclusion they had reached was that defense was fundamentally cost prohibitive. Okay? It is possible but to degrade such an attack, but it's incredibly challenging and cost prohibitive for Russia to be able to do so. And that Russian general purpose forces, the regular conventional military, cannot deter a power like the United States, right? Therefore, deterrence must be cost based. And you need preemptive measures to neutralize the threat early, right? That is, if escalation is inevitable, if conflict is inevitable, then Russia should lead in it rather than retaliate after assuming a very substantial strike and, and considerable amount of damage. Next, the Russian view is that conventional weapons, the kind the United States uses, here we're thinking about long-range standoff precision weapons, can inflict unacceptable damage to the Russian economic and military infrastructure. And that fundamentally places Russian escalation dilemma, this is starting from the 90s, that had to be resolved. That is, Russia was left with a choice of mass nuclear retaliation in response to a precision conventional attack, and not much in between given the state of its general purpose forces. So a lot of the escalation management strategy and thinking on limited use of nuclear weapons came out of that escalation dilemma that began in the 1990s from the Russian perspective. And the last point, Russian military does believe that interwar deterrence, escalation management, is possible, okay? And that calibrated use of conventional weapons or nuclear weapons may not lead to uncontrolled escalation. And here we have intellectual departures from how the late Soviet Union thought about nuclear use to how the Russian be military began thinking about nuclear weapon use and what kind of escalation it would or would not result to starting in the latter 90s. Now, let me sort of take a start, start uh, uh, down the topic of key Russian concepts and the key components of Russia's strategy for escalation management. The first is strategic deterrence. This is a formally adopted concept that's refereed. It's not just a Russian military thinking uh, uh, idea or, or set of deba uh, debates as formally uh, in existence in national security strategy, military doctrine in Russia. So the official Russian Ministry of Defense sort of vision in military terms defines strategic deterrence as a system of forceful military and non-forceful non-military measures intended to restrain the other side from employing force against the Russian Federation, particularly on a strategic scale, right? The strategic deterrence measures are used continuously in peacetime, not just to deter, but also to contain, but in wartime for the purpose of escalation management. So this answers three problem sets, but we're going to focus on a couple of them. One is peacetime containment of the United States, which is not the interest or focus of this presentation. The second one is deterrence in a crisis scenario that is during a period of imminent threat or danger, a direct attack against Russia. And the third is escalation management once conflict has begun and the measures that, that need to be taken by the Russian side to manage escalation. It breaks down to forceful and non-forceful means, but the Russian military understands and is principally talking about the forceful side of the equation, which is the right box, the military means, 
And here you can see it broken out into non-nuclear means and nuclear means, right? And the non-nuclear ones involve a set of what Russians believe to be um, what you could call strategic conventional deterrence or non-nuclear deterrence. These range from long-range precision-guided weapons, cruise missiles and the like, to directed energy weapons, and from the Russian perspective as well, strategic defense of things like integrated air defense, missile defense and the like, right? All right, so um, the military measures that we will discuss fall into principally two categories that I'm going to walk us through in a bit here. One is fear inducement, dissuasion to induce restraint, and the other one are basically limited uses of force or calibrated forms of coercion, right, that provide flexible options once conflict has begun. Um, let's talk about the deterrence framework that comes out of this. There we go. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the slide. So to kind of express how Russian military and national security establishment tends to think about deterrence and the key frameworks that they apply. Uh, to this conversation. First, um, the levels of deterrence. So there are two principal levels. There's a third one that's now emerging, but the two big ones are regional and global, right? And when I think about global, we're thinking about that large scale war construct, right? A big multi-theater conflagration. And when we're thinking about regional, we're thinking much more of the regional war construct is what would deter a regional war. And increasingly in Russian discussion, there's also more thinking on the local war that is ways of deterring a conflict with one country from uh, escalating into a regional context. Okay, in regional deterrence, the Russian view is that the application is a mix of strategic conventional weapons and non-strategic nuclear weapons, right? With some role that is always advocated by strategic nuclear forces, okay? In global deterrence, the dominant share is held by strategic nuclear weapons, the strategic nuclear forces in Russia, RVSN, and also large-scale employment of non-strategic nuclear weapons. Local war deterrence is handled primarily by the general purpose forces, which can affect both war fighting and are easily able to deter a local war with a country like Ukraine, and the strategic conventional component of the force. Um, the types of deterrence here, which is covered, deterrence by fear inducement, you can see them on the actual chart, which is deter it's called deterrence to intimidation, but we prefer deterrence to fear inducement. Deterrence to limited use of force, and then the latter is deterrence to defense. Deterrence to defense is really applicable, in my view, only to the local war scenario, because the Russian military broadly does not believe that deterrence to defense is viable against the challenges they face in the United States, because technologically defense is very hard and cost-wise, it's just too expensive to try to mount that. Um, the, the concept of the way it works primarily works off of strategic deterrence forces. And to understand the force kind of the Russian military built out is that it has functionally designated the military into broadly two force components. One is general purpose forces, and the other one are strategic deterrence forces. Strategic deterrence forces are not a discrete uh, military service. It's not a branch or combat arm. It is a functional designation, a way by which the Russian military force generates from all the stuff it has a set of capabilities that it believe will function, either as a defensive strategic deterrent or as an offensive strategic deterrent, okay? So the best way to express this is that if you think of any, let's take a uh, missile brigade, um, let's take an Iskander missile brigade. It is part of the general purpose force and its general purpose force assignment is to support a combined arms army with precision strikes and fires up to 500 kilometers in depth, right? Mm -hmm. However, it also holds a designation as part of the strategic deterrence forces where it can be called upon by the Russian general staff to provide long range cruise missile strikes against critical economic and military infrastructure in Europe at early on in phase of the conflict or even as preventive strikes. In that role, it is serving as part of the strategic deterrence forces, whereas normally it is performing a sort of war fighting function. The same thing goes for Russian ships and submarines that carry key strategic deterrent capabilities. They carry non-strategic nuclear weapons, long-range precision-guided cruise missiles and the like. And the same thing goes for the Russian aerospace forces. Okay. Um, and, and so the, the idea is always that, that the force is meant to provide flexibility and it's meant to handle, um, as we'll show you in a bit, peacetime day-to-day a period of military threat, which can then translate to sort of a period of imminent danger, that is, when 
the Russian military believes that there is credible threat of imminent attack, and we can talk about what those thresholds are for them, all right? And then through our main war constructs of local, regional, large-scale war. There's also a fourth one that I have not mentioned, which is nuclear war, but that's a strategic nuclear exchange. That's sort of the 35-minute war. Um, it exists in most Russian writing, but has no relevance, well, not much relevance to the escalation management component we're going to be discussing. Okay. Conceptual process flow, there we go. Um, so let me walk through briefly through um, the kind of two main channels of thought. First, and we're going to talk about deterrence through intimidation or fear inducement. So here really, you, both concepts are quite iterative. And in the Russian thinking, um, you essentially first try to determine what you think are vitally important objects belonging to the aggressor state because you're trying to tailor deterrence to them. And what's vitally important to the Sweden is not the same as it's vitally important to the United States per se. And the same thing goes for critical objects. Your critical object target set, which we'll talk about later, for you know, Poland is not going to be the same as your critical object target set necessarily for the United States or for Great Britain. Okay, so you try to first determine vitally important objects, right? These are things that will lead to substantial economic losses or mass damage to population. They are things that um, will threaten uh, both loss of life and way of life. And the goal is in peacetime or during a threatened period, a heightened period of confrontation, to essentially threaten them and then to watch the adversary's reaction to the threats you make. And you see this actually quite a bit day to day. In fact, a lot of what is interpreted as Russian nuclear saber rattling and the like is actually them engaging in this iterative cycle with us, where they are attempting to signal key capabilities and make threats and then watch our reaction and then adjust accordingly because they're actually trying to learn what has effects on the United States on NATO and what doesn't. Um, and essentially, you demonstrate the, the ways and means, the ability, your ability to uh, inflict damage against these targets um, and see how the adversary reacts to shape their thinking. Okay, now, this is primarily for peacetime, all right? Now let's focus on escalation management as we actually enter conflict. Here we abandon deterrence to intimidation and we switch to deterrence to limited use of force. Now we have a determination of objects that carry the greatest value to the other side. These objects are different. They're critically important. Unfortunately, the language is similar compared to vitally important. These are objects that will lead to considerable economic losses um, and really affect the way of life, they will target the leadership and population, but they are meant to minimize civilian losses and collateral damage. They are things that will hurt the adversary, but will um, be calibrated to not build their resolve, right? Because everyone understands that if you inflict damage on the population of the other side, it will not lower their resolve, it will actually increase their resolve in a conflict with you, right? So this is basically the infliction with single or group strikes, first conventional, and then down the line, nuclear, particularly with non-strategic nuclear weapons. You're going to say, what does this look like in real life? I will give you, Iran gave a fantastic example with a critical infrastructure attack against Saudi Arabia the other year by targeting infrastructure that is economically important, not inflicting collateral damage on any of the civilian population, but most importantly, avoiding any American contractors that might have worked this infrastructure. This is a good example of how a country combining basic cruise missiles and drones is able to do that, understanding that that's a very rudimentary capability compared to what the Russian military can actually inflict today, if it wanted to. So just to clear, make clear that this is not a PowerPoint unicorn, we have observed countries doing this sort of thing in real life and attempting to manage escalation from these types of strikes. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll focus just a bit here at the end on conventional nuclear integration and make a comment that uh, from Russian point of view, non-nuclear deterrence and nuclear deterrence are fundamentally complementary. The change that's been taking place is that first, there's a strong emphasis on the role of non-strategic nuclear weapons in regional nuclear deterrence in a possible conflagration with NATO. Why? Because general purpose forces couldn't do anything. Conventional capabilities we talk about right now didn't exist at the time. Um, and this was the most sort of cost-effective and asymmetric approach in their view to deter. They wanted to build out a number of flexible options on this deterrence ladder, obviously, over a period of time. This has now shifted the role of non-strategic nuclear weapons further down into the regional war. Does the Russian belief is they do not need to use nuclear weapons at the outset of a conflict, but 
as the conflict escalates, they very likely will turn to them for nuclear demonstration purposes, uh, as single strikes against the adversary, as group strikes, so on and so forth. A couple big points here. One, there is an argument from colleagues that say that precision conventional capabilities, they now are displacing non-strategic nuclear weapons or nuclear escalation of Russian thinking on this. I'm going to tell you that that is not true and it will never, ever happen, okay, for a couple of reasons. One, Russian military does not intellectually subscribe to the proposition of a conventional only war between pure nuclear powers, especially because this is a dumb losing proposition for them with the United States on a long enough timeline, all right? Two, Russian military does not see conventional capabilities as ever replacing nuclear weapons or non-strategic nuclear weapons and will retain a nuclear war fighting role for a theater nuclear arsenal. Always, forever. That's like basically an assumption. Three, nuclear weapons have psychological effects that are highly useful for escalation management that no amount of conventional weapons can rival or appear. That is an assumed reality and is essential to damage models that Anya is going to talk to you about in a minute. And four, cost-wise, they are the best competitive strategy and they cannot be matched. And many in Russian military believe that basically chasing parity in conventional strike asps with the United States is simply a dumb, uncompetitive strategy because they will never have the funding and the resources to do it. Therefore, nuclear weapons offer a competitive asymmetry. That's weapons, you know, the, for the, the, which you get the bang for the buck is very high. Okay, um, let me turn the section over to Anya. I'll come back. Anya, it would be wonderful if you could talk about uh, damage models. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, so Russian military writings are peppered with references to damage levels. Uh, Russian military thinking on damage has evolved uh, from being based on the employment of strategic nuclear forces to encompassing the whole range of strategic deterrence capabilities that Mike discussed earlier. It's also shifted toward ideas of tailoring da damage levels to the adversary and its population, starting with small levels of damage that could be progressively scaled up for escalation management purposes. And then if that fails uh, towards going into full-scale war fighting. So uh, Russian military thinking in short has evolved from concepts of unacceptable damage that were prevalent during the Cold War to a greater interest in deterrent damage. So during the Cold War, Soviet military analysts like their US counterparts sought to understand what type of assured damage they could inflict on the United States with their strategic nuclear forces. And the ability to inflict this damage continues to be viewed as a criterion for retaliatory and retaliatory meeting strikes for Russian strategic nuclear forces today. Uh, however, at the same time, during the 1990s, Russian understanding of unacceptable damage began to evolve from objective measures that relied on metrics of damage of particular target sets, whether they be military, economic, or population target sets, towards more subjective ideas or perception-centered ideas. Uh, about types of damage that would be unacceptable to a potential aggressor. And so this is where the concept of deterrent damage comes from. So it is very important to Russia's ongoing military analytical discourse on escalation management. The idea here is that the concept of unacceptable damage that used to be so prevalent before is connected to absolute levels of loss for an opponent's state. And so it is excessive. Particularly, uh, Russia found itself in a situation where it now has strategic conventional capabilities that are also able to create the threat uh, of inflicting damage to vital interests and vitally important objects, while among other, other means, this also helps to raise the nuclear threshold or increase the duration of the conventional phase of the conflict. Um, they also realized that non-nuclear capabilities are also able to achieve coercive effects at various stages of the pre-conflict. So in military writings, Deterrent damage appears to range from quite limited and reversible effects on the one end to approaching damage that the opponent can find unacceptable on the other end. So it's tailored and adversary specific, and it can be dosed. Uh, and calibrated amounts of this damage could be applied iteratively as opposed to a singular strike. And they're able to, depending on target selection, also cause cascade effects in an opponent's infrastructure. And so on the slide, you also see two blue definitions from various documents and military writings that get into various degrees of specificity when it comes to deterrent damage. So, um, and you see this graphic on the right of the slide that talks about the material components and the psychological component of deterrence. And so you see when the Russian military uh, writings discuss effects of strategic deterrence, they also talk about um, kind of the political implications 
And the idea here is that um, the type of damage is able to impact the adversary's will to continue certain actions that the Russian leadership is trying to deter. And so the idea was that uh, this damage will be able to inflict cascade political effects on an opponent coalition. So if you target specific members of a coalition and select critically important objects that are important to those members, that will potentially help these guys uh, get out of the conflict. Um, at the same time, uh, the concept continues to evolve in military writings, and there are indications that there's complexity in how to dose deterrent damage and how to assess deterrent damage levels. So this actually, the, the concepts uh, continue to evolve in Russian military writings, and various military research centers continue to write about how to define this. Okay. So next, uh, let me briefly talk about targeting approaches. So um, over the last several decades, Russian military writings on escalation management have shown efforts to understand what constitutes an opponent's critically important military, civilian, and economic targets, um, and kind of an effort to understand how a potential opponent could rank these targets. So what are things that are most important to them? Um, Precision-guided weapons together with ISR infrastructure now allow the Russian military the ability to target key elements of an opponent's critical infrastructure. And so you see in a lot of Russian military writings efforts to break down critical industry systems, um, for example, information systems, uh, fuel systems, energy systems, space, aviation, et cetera, et cetera, into their component parts with an interest of targeting the kind of the, the subcomponents uh, to achieve effects. And in Russian military writings, the emphasis is placed on targets whose destruction has the ability to create cascade effects for the system as a whole, thus achieving uh, strategic effects. So they talk about weak spots or nodes um, of these systems. And the idea is to manage escalation by creating a specific level of psychological coercion on an opponent's leadership or population that will convince the opponent of futility of continuing further action. Um, and as Mike discussed earlier, military writings discuss targets based on their strategic significance and collateral effects. So at the bottom, um, at the bottom left of the slide, this is something that Mike has already talked about, the types of targets, uh, distinction between vitally important objects and targets of significant value when it comes to intimidation and the limited use of force. And so the idea here is that operations could progress from first inflicting damage on military economic targets with less collateral effects to then inflicting damage on targets with greater collateral effects, depending on the desired strategic outcomes and psychological effects. And so if we um, look at the bottom right graphic here, some Russian military writings also subdivide targets in the following way. So they talk about military active objects, military passive objects, and economic objects. And the same author that provides this division of targets, um, if you look at the chart, uh, the graphic on the top right of the slide, uh, kind of proposes an additional category of unquantifiable targets uh, that you see here in kind of various approaches of targeting leadership and targeting the civilian population. And so this author proposed that these unquantifiable targets, which I'll discuss shortly here, actually could have, could make or break uh, es escalation management. So the two types of unquantifiable targets he proposed is, is the first one is objects that are important to the elite or leadership of the country, such as country homes, trade or industrial assets, or objects of specific relevance to the individuals in, char in charge. And then unquantifiable targets too, it's objects that provide high standard of living and spiritual development for the population. So things like cultural centers, religious buildings, and historical monuments. And so this author, for example, was arguing that targeting these things and inflicting damage on them would actually be able to um, help us to control escalation in the situation. So, but again, this is just one example of how the writings proceed. Um, and it's not necessarily representative of current Russian strategy. But at the same time, it reflects these ideas um, of reflexive control, as the Russian military calls it, this idea to try to control your opponent's perception. Okay, excellent. Um, let me take us now briefly to kind of the slide that shows the Russian theory of victory, now that we've gone through the different components and talk a bit about um, uh, how it all comes together. So, as you see, we're going from left to right, where we start off with escalation management towards the right, we really get into war fighting and retaliation. And we kind of make clear that uh, the transition takes place kind of in the middle, um, where the likelihood of escalation management from the Russian perspective declines, 
And then the utility of a lot of these instruments begins to transition much more so into war fighting. Um, first, we'll start off with peacetime inter period military threats. So during this time period, uh, we categorize, well, we categorize things the way Russians categorize them, are principally demonstrations, right? And that is uh, demo uh, demonstrations of the ability and the willingness to use force and the consequences that the adversary will suffer and to communicate to them very clearly that the cost of aggression will exceed the desired benefits. And I want to emphasize this point. There's not a Russian belief that they can deny benefits, but there's a strong Russian belief they can make clear that the cost for the countries involved will dramatically outweigh the benefits that they seek. Okay. And under military threat, this is the period where we really get into uh, deterrence by fear inducement by intimidation, right? Where it lists a set of activities from weapon tests, demonstrative actions by armed forces. A lot of this has to do with military deployments, nuclear signaling, and this is principally a time period of uh, indirect nuclear threats. And at the very outer edges of it, we can transition to single use of precision conventional weapons against critically important infrastructure to the adversary. So this blows something up. It also can involve the use of non-kinetic weapons, like offensive cyber warfare, able to destroy or damage infrastructure very much in the same way during this time period, but have reversible effects. Okay? Um, as we transition more towards uh, local war, regional, large-scale war, I really want to talk about what escalation management means in Russian thinking, because we often shorthand it as escalate to de-escalate, and unfortunately, it's a very limited interpretation. Yes, it is the Russian ideal uh, belief that a form of calibrated escalation could then lead to de-escalation of the conflict. By de-escalation, the Russians mean it won't escalate further, and also war termination on favorable terms. But that is only one sort of idealized scenario solution. In these constructs, the purpose of the limited use of force is as following. One, to limit the conflict scope and prevent it from escalating to the next conflict archetype. So in a local war, to deter other powers from intervening in the local war. Let's say Russia goes to war with Ukraine, and it wants to deter the United States from counter-intervening in Ukraine. So it needs to engage in a host of signaling activities to show to the United States the potential costs of intervening there. All right. Second is to actually limit the escalation to the ongoing conflict, not stop it, but to sustain the conflict at the current sort of um, scope of violence that it exists, right? Uh, and this is essentially a local war, regional war may be acceptable, but they understand that they don't want it to escalate to the next phase. Um, and most of this is basically not, and does not presume that there's necessarily going to be a war termination, but a sensation. So a lot of the concepts come around the idea, as we'll talk about here, of essentially engaging in singular group strikes. These strikes are meant to create, to shock the adversary, to have a stunning effect on them, but not to provoke them. That is, they are meant to find that middle ground between things that will provoke the other side and build resolve on their end, but they're meant to be something different from your day-to-day -day war fight. And here we're thinking about grouped strikes with kinetic and non-kinetic means against this critical infrastructure that's different from actual war fight. Um, and the hope is to create an operational pause, right? And to create a period of negotiation, conflict cessation, or de-escalation favorable to Russia. So here as we get into local war, we see infliction of damage with precision strike, um, but things that don't necessarily uh, uh, reduce adversary potential of their key nuclear forces. Regional war is where we really see the shift where conventional weapons have come in at the early phase of regional war, and then non-strategic nuclear, non nuclear weapons are still very much there, very quite prominently as you get into later phase of regional war. And the best way to describe that is that, um, you know, in Russian thinking, really a conflict between great powers today, the initial period of war is decisive. It's not going to last more than two weeks. The winner or loser would be very clear in the initial couple of weeks of exchange. Okay. After that, the following operations are not that significant. So it's really a conversation of when will nuclear weapons come into play during this kind of rough two week period, right? And what we're really talking about 
is a big transition from non-strategic nuclear weapons having been exercised in different roles on day two or day one, and instead of them being exercised in these roles, potentially depending on what happens in this conflict in the later phases, more on week two, right? But this is important for me to make this point so people don't believe that somehow non-strategic nuclear weapons have gone away from these roles. Um, and then we see basically the transition from escalation management to adequate damage infliction, and that's really where we get into war fighting. There's the employment of these means for the purpose of actually destroying the other side's ability and will to sustain the conflict with conventional means, non-strategic nuclear means, and then select use of strategic nuclear means. Um, before I kind of close out the section, I'll sort of explain one key thing that links the daisy chain that links Russian uh, thinking on the course of utility of these means, because you might say, okay, this is great for escalation management, but the Russian, for limited strikes, Russia doesn't necessarily need this large non-strategic nuclear arsenal, this big strategic nuclear arsenal. And the Russian thinking is like, actually very much they do, because the only way you're going to have success in interwar deterrence with uh, limited use of force is if the other side believes that further escalation will result in uncontrolled escalation and mass nuclear employment. Without that threat, they do not suffer psychological terror. There is actually not a strong incentive, particularly their population. Well, the leadership may be composed of uh, people willing to go through with this. We know some people in D.C. like that, that probably strong nuclear superiority hawks and feel confident they'd go through with counter escalation. But the population needs to believe that limited nuclear use is going to lead to mass strategic nuclear exchange. There has to be the threat that both countries will be functionally destroyed in order for limited nuclear use to have coercive effects, right? And so the Russian belief was that each follow-on steps coercively reinforces the one before it, and that's why they short. And the other side is also true. There's a strong Russian belief that early nuclear threats won't work, they won't be credible, and no, you can actually threaten nuclear use right off the bat in a crisis or a conflict, and also that the political leadership wouldn't authorize it anyway, so it's kind of a dumb idea to write about, right? So you need to have um, options on the deterrence ladder that you're going to employ, okay, which will make follow-on nuclear threats credible, but you cannot go high and to the right with nuclear threats so early on. They're not going to be coercive, and you're not going to be credible in making them. And I think, I mean, kind of personally looking at it, I think they get that quite right. Um, okay, we have just a couple more slides mm -hmm. uh, on the study and sort of uh, the, the final conclusion of the debate. Let me get quickly through this because we're running short yep, on time. Super quickly, yeah. Okay. Sure. So on this slide before you, you see more details about the data sample that we used. So these are Russian language articles. And what we did is we essentially went through the available universe of Russian open source military writings. These were gathered from a variety of sources, from databases, from websites, from other libraries. So we, our sample was about 700 Russian language articles from authoritative defense publications. So you see them here on the list. Some of them are um, made, uh, you know, produced by the Russian general staff. Some of them are much more a product of uh, military academies or uh, the Central Science Research Institutes, MOD institutes. The authors are primarily military officers employed by the Russian military think tanks or educational institutions. Um, so essentially, we collected them, we coded them, and then we analyzed them. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to make a comment on sort of the evolution of the debates sure so um as a part of this product we uh we, we did two uh two we produced two reports and if you look at the second report it analyzes see, these concepts from the lens of looking at who wrote the articles so this is a study essentially of who who's who in the, these russian military debates um and how how this exchange of ideas takes place in military journals over the last 30 years so when we looked at these articles um, and we identified critical articles that focused on the escalation management problem set, um, we asked us ourselves, what are the key debates? So who's writing and who's responding to whom? Uh, so as a part of that, we identified three key debates. One was regional nuclear deterrence. Second one was non-nuclear deterrence. Um, and the third is this discussion of evolution of damage concepts. Um, so the regional nuclear deterrence debate took place between 1997 and 2002. And this was essentially a question of what is the role of Russian uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons when Russian uh, conventional capabilities um, are in a state of decay and it is trying to deal with a threat of a U.S. aerospace attack. This is what Mike talked about earlier. The second debate was about non-nuclear deterrence. It began in the early 2000s and to some extent continues to this day. 
this question about what do we do with strategic conventional capabilities um, and where are they credible at regional levels? Uh, the third debate was this discussion of damage concepts that I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, if you look at this uh, graph on the right, you essentially see a tracing our authors from various military uh, institutes arguing specific points, fine points of the debate. And you see these military institutes range from uh, folks who deal primarily with the rocket strategic rocket forces problem set who argue that no, non-nuclear deterrence is never credible, you need preemptive nuclear threats, to folks who actually do modeling and planning on uh, Russian strategic conventional weapons, who plan this out to the degree of target sets and kind of you know, argue that some of these things will be much more credible if we target things in this specific way. So our findings here um, are threefold. One is obviously that Russian strategic conventional capabilities are growing in importance in Russian thinking on escalation management. Some judge them insufficient for deterrence at higher threshold of conflicts, requiring further investments into means to operationalize this concept. Um, the second finding is that um, the role of non-strategic nuclear weapons is not only enduring, but remains prominent in regional contingencies, as Mike talked about earlier. Um, non-strategic nuclear weapons complement the conventional and strategic nuclear capabilities, but they're not a substitute. And the third uh, is that Russian military thought has moved away from unacceptable damage as a basis towards concept premised on deterrent damage. Um, and so this approach is iterative, and the desired de-escalatory effect is clear, although opinions diverge still on how best to qualify and define this type of damage. Awesome. Okay, um, one like last bit, and just uh, to kind of put the right caveats and context for what we talked about, I think, how to think about it. So first, very quick, when we say Russian strategy for escalation management, we're talking primarily about Russian military thinking, and I want to really express why we study this, what we learn, and how to situate it in thinking about what Russia will actually do. The use of nuclear weapons is an expressly political decision in Russia. Okay, it will be decided and it will be um, will be made by the senior political leadership by the Russian president. Okay, what we study here, first and foremost, really reflects one the courses of action that will be presented to the Russian political leadership and the theory behind why it would work to allow and to create for them flexible options during threatened period of conflict and as the conflict escalates. Two. They shed a lot of ambiguity in, they shed light on a lot of ambiguity in formal Russian documents, doctrines, which are off course, intentionally written ambiguously, all right? Three, it really expresses to us the theory of victory that the Russian military has and how they got there over the years and the problems they're trying to solve. However, it does not tell us for a fact what the political leadership will do in any contingency. We do know that and do not know that with certainty and we really dislike it when people read operational planning or strategic operational planning by general staff and then try to translate it and say this is russian political strategy or political intent track drives us crazy so it's important to understand second we do not know the degree of confidence the russian political leadership has in the efficacy of these plans or the over under that they will work that is an area of research force for us to pursue what we can say for certain is one these are not russian military fantasies these Com these ideas are formally incorporated into national security concepts, which are adopted and signed by Russian political leadership. Two, Russian political leadership frequently speaks on the subject of nuclear deterrence and Russian nuclear force posture in the way that suggests they are highly familiar and know what they are talking about. In fact, I would say in the way quite superior to our own in terms of their familiarity with the topic. And three, Russia engages in regular nuclear exercises in which senior political leadership participates and shows that they actually are going to push the button and are actually there to participate in a host of exercises that Soviet, Soviet political leadership rarely participated in, which suggests to us that they are much more familiar with what's going on in Russian military thinking than some previous political leadership would. Okay, I raised some questions here on areas of future research and kind of questions of interrogation from this. Um, but as always, I just wanted to make those caveats as we close out this presentation. I'll turn it over to Brad for a Q&A. That was great. Thanks to both of you. Excellent presentations. Very interesting work. Uh, let me make clear to the, to the group of participants that uh, Michael and Anya are speaking uh, from and, and using a lot of graphics from uh, two reports that they've recently concluded and posted online. So there are a number of comments here about um, 
whether it's possible to get the slides and, and the, the two reports are uh, available online for downloading and they make uh, ex excellent reading uh, and I commend them to you.